shall we shall we start? So, what would you like to play for for us today, Eric? First movement of Mozart three. Mozart three. Okay, excellent. Yes.
Bravo, bravo, bravo. Beautiful playing, yeah. I, I, I somehow feel like, because I've heard this one um, once uh, in your uh, right. second round, right? Yeah. I think the cadenza was even more spontaneous this time, which I really like. There's a lot of, you know, freedom in it. You know, I, I truly enjoyed it. Um, since we have very limited time, so I wanted to maybe give you as much help as I possibly can. So forgive me if I'm being very detailed because you're such a fantastic violinist and I wanted to maybe to offer what I have. Uh, first of all is the general feeling in terms of rhythm. Um, because, you know, we, we're, we're living in this period of time where everything was so fast, the travel is so easy, right? Air travel, especially. And when you thinking about um, travel from Vienna to Paris, it's just one hour flight. And uh, but in Mozart's time, 200 years ago, that was not easy. You know, you 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 are either on a horseback, you're you know, it's, it, it takes days, weeks, sometimes months to travel to another city. But at the same time, the life pace is much slower compared to today. So I think we tend to kind of um, have this mindset is like, OK, we have to be on time. We have to be on top of our schedule. And then we actually lose the, the, the quality of, you know, life is beautiful and enjoy it every uh, moment of life. So I think particularly in this uh, movement, there is a lot of small notes. You played it so cleanly and so beautifully, but somehow I'm missing a little bit of space between those small notes, even in the beginning, right? So you have to almost sing every note, uh, uh, feel the backside of the beat rather than moving forward because your, your tendency is... Uh, I'm exaggerating, of course, you didn't do that quite um, as much, but then I feel like that the, the last beat tends to go forward. Why don't you try to actually feel that you're, you know, you know, sit back and relax <laughs> and enjoy the flight. All right. So. Right. So, you know, you always feel like there's space between the notes okay shall we try to explore a little bit just maybe this four bars will be enough four or three. yeah a little bit before <laughs> Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, great, great. I, I think that's much better. I know it's very small detail and it's a little difference, but this makes a huge difference when you play with an orchestra. Just imagine to have 50 people behind you on your back. You know, you, you can sometimes do certain things when you play alone, right? So um, another thing I would like to point out is the, um, the, the end of this particular phrase, because uh, Mozart is not only a great composer, but he's also a genius. He could have written something like, um, you know, and that uh, it, it's still pretty good, right? But instead, uh, ha, surprise, a dominant chord. And uh, you probably know uh, music theory. That's a half cadence, which is totally unexpected. And plus, he added two beats of emptiness to let the audience wonder, OK, what's going to happen next? So I'm missing a little bit of that surprise quality. And also, let the sound hang in there. Don't, don't let it die away yet. And also, again, instead of moving forward, try to pull it back a little bit. Uh, it comes not as a surprise, but yeah, so that that's a real release, right? So that is a very interesting um, moment to, to me. Okay, so um, before you start again, I would like to also mention that make sure the these kind of notes, especially it's a downbeat, it, the, the first note of a slur is always more expressive. 
right to me so i think you you might want to vibrate the first note instead of the second because like you kind of did yeah it's convenient i know <laughs> but uh, we have to let the phrase decide the bowing and vibrato instead of let the technique decide what bowing <laughs> we choose right it's not the other way around okay Do, would you mind trying this, uh, this 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 one more time and then we can move on Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, you know, maybe since you stopped, I wanted to add one more thing, just uh, my personal opinion in terms of the trill, because if you take away the trill and only look at the melody, the skeleton of this phrase, uh, we want to hear instead of, instead of, uh, that's why personally I would prefer not would you mind trying that as well? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I know, I know. It's it's hard to 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 immediately adjust. It's okay. I'm not not gonna torture you anymore, and we can uh, move on from here. Uh, the next phrase was also very beautiful. I'm thinking maybe when when Mozart did something twice, then it, it's an indication of phrasing again. Right? <laughs> it, it sounds repetitive somehow to me. Maybe think about you know how you want to arrange the phrase and where the phrase is going. Is it coming away <laughs> or? Um, one way or the other, you know, you have to be very clear, even in front of a screen. I would say particularly in front of a screen, your intention has to be so clear so that everybody in the room, in the audience or in front of the other side of the screen, uh, notice what you want to do. OK, maybe just from the second price so right here. Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful, beautiful. That was much better. Okay, now I wanted to talk about um, particularly the articulation in this phrase. And you see, there are you know a lot of versions, uh, uh, so-called the Urtax version of Mozart. There's Baron Reiter, there's Henley, there's you know, many of those, and uh, there is constant debate about the carrot, the dots, uh, eighth note with dots, quarter note with dot, and all of those. But I think the, 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 the bottom line is, you know, still the phrasing. You know, if you kind of, you know, did all the research and played whatever lens that you think is correct, but then I didn't really feel the direction where you want to go, then I think everything will be a waste. And then, you know, the old masters, which I really, really admire, like Chrysler or David Ostrach, when they performed those pieces, those so-called urtex didn't really exist. I mean, they just play off whatever they have, but then they make such a beautiful sound. So I would rather to have a beautiful phrase, beautiful sound, rather than being original first. Okay, so that being said, I think here, I would love to have some sort of a phrase. And no matter what bowing you use, and I know you have probably already an idea how long you want this dot to be, and that's totally up to you, but I'd like to hear one phrase instead of I hear an accent. Also, afterwards, we want to hear a progression. Right? Instead of accent, accent. I, I hear four accents in two bars. So instead, the long phrase, right? Also, no accents here. So no matter how important you think this is, it's not as important as the downbeat. Yeah, it's just the end of the phrase, right? So can we 
um, apply those ideas and try the second phrase again, please. Beautiful, beautiful. Wow, you, you, you did it so well. <laughs> okay, so moving on. Um, the next phrase for me is very, very much like an opera uh, uh, moment, uh, you know, very operatic moment, uh, particularly for Mozart. Um, one thing I would suggest is, again, to have a longer phrase because no accent. I feel like there is too much beats going on. Maybe thinking about a more horizontal line and also with the smaller notes, I know uh, pinky is not the most convenient finger to vibrate, but it happens that for me that is very, very expressive. And just imagine a great opera singer, a soprano, how would she sing this kind of instead of just I mean, it's kind of interesting, but then, you know, you wanted to express the most interesting note. For me, it's, it's an E. And that's a moment I always call it uh, raising your eyebrow. You know, Mozart likes to joke around. And that's one of the moments he's like, oh, oh, wow. OK, so maybe I know it's not convenient to vibrate on the E, but to try to add just a little bit. That's more lively to me. OK, shall we try? I, I think maybe to make it even more interesting, we can explore uh, certain things. Um, first of all, is that's another eyebrow raising moment. All right, so to make sure that that really came out. I, I, I feel like you wanted to do something, but it was not quite enough to really come to me, yes, you know, in front of the screen. Uh, another thing, oh no, sorry to be a little technical, but I think maybe that will be helpful for you throughout the movements. There's a lot of figures, like uh, a slur plus two dots. You know, let's do it slowly and really break down what's going on here, because I would like to hear a lot of things. First of all, so that's where you want to go. It's never right so it's just a pickup so okay second thing i would like to have a release after the second note of the slur in other words yeah the release has to be there i would like to hear no matter how short it is a ring after the slur and those two notes needs to be exactly the same and also please try to bite the string a little bit so that it really articulates like a great pianist. And I would say even further, that's um, a great pianist play on a piano that uh, without so much pedal. <laughs> Is that, does that make sense? So these are also very different. Those two slurs I would like to hear. Uh, sorry to be so detailed because I think th these are the thing that separates from like a very good perform performance and an amazing performance because these are the little details that we pay attention to. Okay, so how about from again? I like the the fancy bowing. Um, try not to make it too fast. That it sounded almost like Paganini's so or almost like too fast. So maybe to tilt your bow angle towards yourself a little bit so that it's, it's not so flat. And then maybe 
you know, calculate the distance between the string. So it's still in the rhythm, right? That's a little too fast. <laughs> okay, right there. Yeah. Are we doing in tempo or under? Sorry? Um, you can do the tempo, yeah. I'm the, the, just, just a practice tip for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's quite right. I think um, this is maybe controversial, and I wanted to just share with you uh, some of my thoughts in terms of these um, passing 16th notes, because um, you can play it like very, very clean and rhythmically correct. There's nothing wrong with it. But I think with the character of Mozart particularly, I think you can maybe explore a little bit flexibility Particularly here, uh, you have nothing going on in the orchestra or in the piano. It's just by yourself. So as long as you keep the integrity rhythmically, right? Um, I think you can maybe explore a little bit. Imagine how a very good ballet dancer would, would, would dance this moment. It's like... So there can be a little bit push and pull. So... Instead of one, two, three, well, maybe think about one longer line. And even the those three slurs are slightly different, right? And again, feel the backside of the beat. I feel like, oh, because you're much younger than I am, you like to, to really go forward, have so much adrenaline going on. Maybe I'm, I'm too old, but then, you know, I do feel like I need a little more space. And as an audience, I need a little more time to enjoy those moments. Okay, how about from here? <laughs> Beautiful, yeah. I, I, I know. I the next contestant already checked in, but uh, I would like to work on a little bit longer if that's okay. I, I think there is a couple of things I would like to um, to repeat, which is the the end of each note needs to ring a little bit more, particularly here. The the note tends to go a little flat just because it's so high up on the E string. So I would vibrate but not so much so that we still hear the center of the pitch but at the same time please release the pressure of your bow so it's not it's either stopping yeah it's not stopping so move your bow but release the pressure of the bow so, so, so we hear like a breathable sound right there and the other place I want you to feel a little more space Especially the second time when you know Dina has the yeah the, 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 the little notes, you now play around the rhythm a little bit. Uh, again, hold it back a little bit, and and then you know we have this figure again. I believe the dot is there for a reason, so maybe not completely. Maybe, yeah. maybe, yeah. Maybe here you can do a little more because here the orchestra adding in that's always a problematic spot for projection. That you can really bring it up, but 
the you can uh, lasting sorry to be so detailed uh, there is a... again the fourth beat is not that important i hear a very big accent i, I know you want it to be expressive but in the larger picture You wanted to grow from there, right? So, so like that. Uh, maybe from. Is that a good place to start? First time. That's much better, yeah. Uh, a little tip for uh, avoiding the, uh, the the accent will be a bow distribution. So I, I noticed that you you go you went all the way to the tip. Of course, w will be an accent. So half bow and save it for later on. Okay, yeah. Unfortunately, we have to stop. But before we end the class, is there any questions that you would like to ask me that I can answer you quickly? Um, I don't think anything particularly about the Mozart. Um, okay, uh, that's, that's yeah. great. <laughs> yeah. No, it's a pleasure listening to you uh, again. Okay, I'm looking forward to listening to you. Mm.
Bravo. Um, I listened also, of course, in the semi-final to the piece, yes. and I was hoping, uh, hoping to meet you one day because I thought it was a wonderful playing. And now, yeah. already here, uh, we are talking. Yeah. Um, I think the last note, you know, uh, the very last note, start at the beginning. I think uh, now the way you played it now was a little different from in the competition, the last note. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Then you were so uh, happy that you ended it, everything and it uh, the ball speed was too fast to the sound and, <laughs> and yeah. things like that. So it's, um, we always learn. Um, what I think is, uh, in my opinion, it's the process you are in that's important. Uh, and um, I think that when we reach a certain level in playing, it becomes harder and harder to know what to do. Because we have actually worked so much on everything. And then we come to a stage where we start to maybe sometimes just keep it in shape and repeat ourselves. Mm -hmm. But I think that this is the um, exact place where the, the real interesting stuff starts. Because then we're actually exploring <laughs> new territory. Mm -hmm. um, let's see... Uh, do you have your music in front of you? Yes. Because not always you know it from memory, but not always all the bar numbers. Mm. <laughs> Maybe, I don't know. I don't know. No. <laughs> <laughs> Some I, people I do, you know, but it's not necessary. Yes, uh, the seventh fold bar in, uh, uh, in bar 15. Mm. Yes. Um, tell me, how did you work on uh, that bar? Uh, do you remember from the, when you started it? And, and, and what process did you go through? Mm. Um, I think I always wanted this bar to be broad mm. um very majestic and then i think i started um trying to bring out the top line more so getting away from the base um, yeah. faster mm. and just trying to really like bring this um bring this like corral kind of mm. bar out and, and you succeeded very well uh can i ask you a question and you just truthfully answer if you have thought about it or not did you think about when you're doing these chords where your weight on your feet are? Can you repeat that again? The weight on your feet, the, the way you're standing while you're playing these broad uh, chords. No. Are you standing on both of them, on left uh, feet or on right foot or... You I don't know. About it. I don't no. know. It might be something there because um, I'm not the first one. To, to check on that and uh, but it's important that all the aspects in the violin playing that we actually are curious to try it out so can you play that bar now standing on the left foot standing on the right foot afterwards and then in the middle and, and see if there is a different uh, effect or not mm. okay just from this bar yeah uh, you don't need to do the whole thing just, just a few chords you know mm. <laughs> And then go to the right foot. And do the middle one. Yeah, the interesting thing is does it sound exactly the same or can you spot any differences? I think it sounds different or it feels different. Yes, so tell me, what does it feel? Mm. Um, I mean, both feet feels better because it's centered. Mm. Um, yeah, it's more grounded instead of really off balance um, either foot. Yes, um, did you listen to the sound? How do we do this? Uh, do it again and then just not focus on the feeling in your body, but uh, the actual sound that gets out of uh, the instrument. Um, yes. I remember that a little from when mm. I just played it. Um, yeah, try, try, try again left foot and then right foot. 
uh, and and see about uh, the sound. going to the left I almost feel like on the right there's more um there's more power in the top notes just because it's leaning um this more on the top strings but you are absolutely right even through this kind of zoom platform it sounds a little thinner on the left side <laughs> and uh, and there so everything we do has an effect and that's why we, we try out. We are always searching when we are practicing for something better, even if it sounds good. We are searching for something better. I think there is another thing. When you go from the left side, you stood a little bit on the left side to begin with, not centered either. Um, we tend to work harder than when we release it. Mm. Uh, so just try a few things. And can we try another thing as well? This might be a little hard. I don't know your uh, background, but are you used to playing without the uh, head on the um, chin rest? Um, maybe not so much, but I can try. Yeah, uh, it's, it's really hard if you are not uh, constantly working on it. And it's not necessary to play with it off, but I would like you to just play a few of them, at least releasing a little bit to see if you can increase the uh, resonance because this is uh, sometimes uh, making it there instead of uh, more church-like. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that is really difficult. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like completely off or just relaxed? Oh, you can, if you see it, this or just not touching, but it can be in the same place. And also, uh, your right shoulder, go a little bit to your right foot now. That will keep your right shoulder a little bit more relaxed by uh, it just happens. And also, instead of, uh, and also meet a little bit with your violin. So it's not only this side and, and, and see if uh, anything happens with the sound. Mm. Yes, so um, you make the final decisions, but if you believe there is something to find there, explore it. And it will only be better because now you try it for the first time and the way you usually play the, those chords, you've done millions of times or <laughs> a lot of them. So you have to equal them a little bit before making any judgment. Mm -hmm. It sounded wonderful, but there are the small details that uh, is very interesting because uh, they can make you develop further mm -hmm. uh, and not having the feeling you know i don't know how old you are but in five years time you're five years older and you would like to sound better five years from now than now <laughs> so it means you have to try out things you're not doing today <laughs> um uh, did you, the, um, let's see, um, when you uh, have this one uh, and, and release the sound this way, your shoulder should be freer. Uh, can you have um, a feeling that uh, you're playing to the back of the hall also, you know, row 36 or whatever? Oh, you can play everything if you like. Mm. Yes. You know, you have made a perfection of uh, the way you play. Uh, you are perfected in the way that it, everything works, your angle of the bow, the violin. So if you do a tiny place, one 
place, there is a lot of other small things that have to follow. You know, it's a kind of uh, we don't like that because it drags us back to whatever we are doing the whole time. So, um, but if you find uh, a tiny thing, maybe the angle of the bono because the violin was a little bit more free and a little higher than um, the. I, do you know? Um, do you read a lot about music? No, admittedly not. Um, because today we find a lot of things, you know, we have wonderful uh, teachers, we have great lessons, we listen to the masterclass with our fellow students and elsewhere, and we, we can see everything on, online. But in my experience, there is something that you find written down that it makes you reflect on things and um, one of my favorite things I haven't met anyone read it yet it's uh, the problems of tone production in violin playing by Carl Flesch it's wow. only 20 pages it's very small there are a few secrets there that uh, was a shock for me when I read it the first time because I uh, it all made sense so now, when you do those chords again, can you do the bottom two ones and find the exact contact place where you're very happy with the... Yes, this is good. Hmm. Yes, bravo. That's beautiful. Can you do the top two now? and see where your perfect contact point is on the top two. Yes, is it closer to the bridge than the yeah. bottom two? Yes. When you turned a little bit, that changed uh, when you did uh, standing on the right foot. Then you, you need to adjust so you're not closer to the uh, bridge on the lower one and not on the top ones. I see. You, you, you see how, how everything is a kind of uh, <laughs> perfect, perfectly balanced. And if it is, you can actually play more or less the way you want because it's in balance and you are in balance, so no problem. But if you want to search something, uh, it's the whole thing that needs the little adjustment, not just a uh, little thing. But try that to, to see if you can... Uh, so, uh, you make this the perfect place on the E string. Yes, good. Uh, I, I felt you have some strength in you. So, uh, I forget it's only down bows, it's singing through, you know, so it's beautiful. Uh, you did that really well. Let's go to another place where we have some interesting stuff. Um, yeah, can we find 56? Yes. Um, when I suggest something to try out, it's just for trying, but you will experience that you have a different effect. But just predate the way you did, and then I will, uh, will tell you a different way of doing it. Mm. Okay. Yes, good. What were you thinking when you were doing it? Um, very like airy, like over the fingerboard kind of um, quality. Yes. Um, yeah. um, and I think that was beautiful. I would like you now to try to go even further in that direction mm -hmm. in a way that you we use our bow arm but without the flexible wrist. Like the way you're never allowed to play. <laughs> With the whole arm. Hmm. 
Like yes. That? Yeah. Um, I remember the first time I got to this. Uh, I was playing in a master class, the, you know, the banyan fiddle. Uh, and I did the normal thing with everything right, and then I just tried, yeah, sounds good. <laughs> because uh, the master class I got was from a real fine artist who showed me that, yes, sometimes you, you need to do that. Uh, because you were already on that track, I don't know if you need to do, but it's really good to just experience that it's what you get out of the instrument that matters. Uh, and if it's not by any book and it sounds fantastic, it's fantastic. <laughs> so it's cool. I, I think you get the sur la touche, the fingerboard kind of feeling, uh, the float, uh, flute. Uh, sound and it's fun <laughs> and it's also important to have fun you can just try it uh, try it one more time yes bravo uh, the end on that page uh, what would you say your last finger pizzicato downwards? Was that your maximum uh, or did you uh, have another uh, gear? Mm. I think so. Yeah, it's a decision. It's a musical decision. How far do I want to go? Do I do uh, go to my maximum for, for this dum, bum, bim, bum, there? Or do, am I a little more reserved and not give away my maximum? So, but in your practice room, I think it's important to go to the extremes because it makes your, um, you somehow widen your uh, space. Mm -hmm. um, and I was also curious about um, bar number 64, the first one with the bowl. Um, should, would you like that to sound like the finger pizzicato afterwards? Or do you like it to be longer? Mm. I guess I was playing it pretty long. Yes. Um, but yeah, I could try making it shorter, more like a pit. Yeah. You see, in, in my opinion, it really doesn't matter. What does matter is that you get what you want. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know what you want, then you know what your process should be. <laughs> Knowing what you would like to tell and go for it uh, one way or the other. Mm. Um, maybe also it has something to do with, um, can you take from 59 and just go on to the end of the page? Mm. Um, I, I think it's good when you can play with a safety net, but we should never think you're doing it. You know, in a way we should feel that the music has driven you to the extreme, but of course you are somewhere in full control, but we would like to be brought out in this place as an audience. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, Good. Can you do the final run up slow one time? Mm. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Good. Um, you know, when you are climbing up, you know, that's the feeling. It's higher and higher and higher. Um, but how would the feeling be if your volume was a little higher? It would be feeling like falling down, wouldn't it? Yeah. So it's a completely yeah. different feeling to, to, to fall down than to climb up. Hmm. Yeah. Uh. 
Yes. Now, when you do things two different ways, in a way you can't do that later. You have to choose. But the good thing is that when you practice, you can make it into a competition. And you can really try to do the one better than the other. Mm. Uh, and then if you find that one is better than the other, then you're very lucky because then it's easy to choose. If there are not any difference between them, then you know it doesn't really matter <laughs> which one you, you take. So you can't possibly, you can only win. And this is the way we should uh, make our practice, like a win-win situation, whatever you're doing. So you either get confirmed that what you did uh, before is better than the thing you tried, and that's good to know, or the other one was actually better. <laughs> um, let's do that one um, a little uh, slower even. So it will be different playing when you're playing slow, but, but just do it uh, it's slow. And I would say now you don't need to go this high. It was just uh, that you don't have the feeling that you are really climbing because something happens here when you are climbing. It, it becomes some kind of, you have some space here still at the top when, when you're not too low. Mm. And that might give you confidence. When you play it in tempo, the top note, do you make a champagne on it or do you just play it? Mm. I try, but I don't know how um, effective it is. <laughs> yes, uh, just do it slowly and, and, and see how you can... Yes, did you try to, to take it from mm. feels like it's from, from, from the air. Yeah, and that's possible to do without lifting the bow off the string. In my opinion, whenever we do something like we want to do, we always sacrifice the note before. Mm -hmm. So if we... This one is really the sound of our, So you feel that both of them are uh, your best notes. Mm. Yes. Sometimes uh, when you have this uh, run, without telling anyone, you always have time to do the last two ones with the maximum quality. You don't need to rush around. Bling, bam. Okay. Mm. So it gives it something. Uh, can you try? So, so it's the key. Yeah, you don't really catch the top one as the strongest one. Mm. Yes, good. Um, show me your fingerings once for that. Mm. Um, I think I was actually ending on a four for the top note. Yes. Uh. Mm. Um, I'm very interested in fingerings because uh, the way fingerings has developed through the history is very interesting. So I have, uh, went in to see what kind of fingerings were Paganini using himself. Because now today we use very modern fingerings and they are really good. But they use different fingerings in the old days. And I would like to know that and I would like to try them to see what qualities uh, there is in them. So I try out every possible good fingering 
and the good stuff there are many good fingerings and some bad. Mm. Um, your fingering I find is really good there. But can you try to uh, shift on every G with the first finger? So now you have two good fingerings. Yeah. Now, if you work on those, both of them, um, then you can have the real competition. And I think, you know, we constantly should do that. We shouldn't like uh, not stop trying. And I, I think that one is a good one. So if your is a little stronger than your fourth finger, then you might choose it. But then something in you is telling, I don't want my fourth finger to be not as good as the third. So then you start working on your fourth finger. <laughs> and then you might play third for a, a moment and then you turn back to the fourth because you know. Do you know any exercises that really strengthen your fourth fingers? So it can be, uh, do you know, do you have any good exercises for your fourth finger? I don't know if they're good. Do you have any that you recommend? Yes, uh, but maybe it's the one uh, you already know. I don't know. No, I, I'd love to hear what yours are. Yeah. I, if you look upon the hand, mm -hmm. you see this is very small. If I do like this, put the two hands next to each other, I have kind of seven uh, fingers to use and I have two in the middle. So it, I feel it's stronger now because it has from both hands and it's in the middle, you know. So this is a, a mental kind of picture that is not the outer uh, finger, it's the center one. Because if you put a mirror there, it's actually in the very center. So uh, when I always tell me when there is, no, I'm not using the little fourth finger, I'm using the middle one in, in the double one. That helps because you create a balance in the hand where you're not putting it on like that, but you're really feeling, feeling this. So. Uh, so that's the one thing and then I if you do a lot of uh, This kind of uh, with the three and four uh, Exercises like that that gives a real strength to the fourth finger and Then you will develop a little muscle here that will give it more stability and Then it will not matter so much which finger you're using because you have actually done something with your forefinger to make it not always being the smallest and one. And because you use it already, that's a very good sign. It means that it's good. So the question is, is it your best finger? And if it's not your best finger, then you continue to find ways of making it better. Because you will actually like all four fingers to be equally good. Uh, so this exercise is with uh, the sixth, you know, well, that gives you a very fun. And that's also a beautiful exercise to do with your head free. Uh, so, so, and that gives you this, this shape there. Mm. So, um, try out uh, things because now, let's say, in five years time, if you do exactly what you did now, it will still be a wonderful one, but it's development that is important. Mm -hmm. And if you can't figure out what's better than you're doing, search for it. Mm -hmm. And you can find it in a concert, you can find it in a book, you can find it inside yourself, I don't know, but it's there. There is always better somewhere. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that's the, the kind of like finding gold. So what um, would you like to see us about? What, what's going on for you? Um, so I guess today I'd like to play the Retrocitivo and Scherzo by Chrysler. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a really great piece. I really like playing it a lot, but I think in terms of just like how it feels physically, I think it's really, it, 
it's fairly easy for like the left my left side like with a lot of I have a habit of pushing my wrist out like this and that causes a lot of tension with especially a lot of the, like the double stops and stuff like that so I guess that's been something I've been trying to work on with this piece while does that yeah. does that only happen when you play this piece or do you does your wrist go out on many pieces um it's yeah I guess many pieces <laughs> okay so um okay well we can start if you want to just play through i we hear you perfectly if you hear us okay how much of it do you want her to play well it's a short piece i mean i i forget how long it is how long is it um it's about four four or five minutes so yeah not so the question is whether to play the whole thing or to just zero in on the places that you feel cause you tension okay um maybe we could just play through the piece would that be all right Sure.
Great. Beautiful. Great. Oh, it's wonderful. Wonderful. So you can go first if you want. Um, uh, so how did you feel playing that? All right. <laughs> um, I guess given the nature of the, the scherzo, um, my right arm tends to, I mean, generally with run throughs of this piece, my right arm tends to feel kind of tired by the end of it. I wouldn't say it's, it feels very tense. It's just a, just how much, given how much I've been moving the arm, it feels a little bit more tired. Um, with the left hand side, um, it doesn't feel I don't think I feel anything painful. It's um although it does feel a lot of the tension that does happen in the hand, it tends to manifest like here in this area in the thumb. Right here, or I guess below the thumb. So I definitely feel a little bit of that there. I would be um curious to know what what happens if you have the instrument totally horizontal because um it looks to me i can't be sure at all but it looks to me like you have long limbs it looks you look like you have a long arm and maybe a, a long hand fingers i'm not sure but if if you if you have extra length uh then you kind of need to bend something to make it fit so i would be curious if the instrument goes down the more it goes down the more uh cramped you're going to be and so you want to have more space. So I, I'll be curious if you just play, um, you can play open strings or scales and look straight ahead without your head on the chin rest and just have, try to have the instrument at, uh, horizontal, totally purely horizontal. And tell me um, what happens to your wrist when it's up there, when the instrument's up there. Um, just a scale? Is that you, can play, you can play music or a scale, it's up to you. It's, it's... So wait, your head is not, facing us well maybe maybe we should let her do that variable maybe not sure. don't, okay, so don't just, change just yeah. hold it up you can put your head wherever you are comfortable <laughs> and just just think about the instrument being totally like a table horizontal yeah. Can you play something that's going to make where your you, you, your wrist has to flex like on, on some of the notes you played in the last piece? Um, you could even play the beginning of the scherzo. Okay. Try that. Okay. So... I don't know. What do you think? Is there any 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 difference uh, if it's horizontal? It it felt a little bit more open, just um, which I guess feels kind of obvious. But um, <laughs> yeah, that that felt a little bit more just opened up a little bit more. I think sound wise to it felt a little bit more resonant that way. My other suggestion would be if, if it's true that your limbs are long and you have to flex your wrist some to, re to reach a certain uh, note. Um, are there, can you get an instrument that's larger? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> a viola, you could turn it to a viola. They can't want. custom make us. Okay, okay, okay. There are no, plenty okay. of long limbed. Okay, violinists. okay. So <laughs> in order to play with a horizontal instrument, uh, you probably need to do some arm exercises to make it really, because you have, then you have to bring your right arm higher too slightly. So you might have to do some training for your upper body to feel comfortable up there, or maybe not, I don't know, maybe not. Well, we can come back to that. You don't by any chance have a, cause I was gonna say exactly the same thing, which is of course why we're married and do this. Um, but I had a, I, for, in addition to the, problems you complained about. If your angles are different, it's gonna affect the cocking of the wrists in both arms. So if the scroll is up, that automatically makes the wrist go down in the right hand. 
So in a way, if it's if it's hard for you to figure out how to do this, just think flip, you know, reverse your hands, mm -hmm. scroll up. It will it automatically changes the angle. You don't have to do anything. Um, it happens by itself. What the other advantage of that, even if you said you had no problems whatsoever, I think part of the reason that you could be getting tired is because you're working hard to make a sound. And the reason you're working hard to make a sound is that if your instrument is down, you're, it's like, um, what do you always say about striking a match? Oh, friction, lack of friction if it's down. Well, that, that's if you're going down. Right, right. right. So if you're going down, you're, you can't get the friction. If, if you're up, you get automatic contact with your instrument. Mm -hmm. But if you're down, you're sort of chasing your sounding point all the time. Mm -hmm. So, and then you're probably thinking, oh, I don't hear enough sound or the kind of sound I want or whatever it is. And so you play more in the right hand, but it's not getting you more, it's just getting you tired. Yeah. So it has a lot of advantages, even if you had absolutely no problems whatsoever, because that's gravity doing its job. And then it's, you've got a better sounding point. So I invented this totally masochistic way of keeping the scroll up. <laughs> Do you have a music stand by any chance? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can bring that. Yeah, that'd be great. Like here, so, uh -oh. yeah, it's just... so the, what why I say masochistic is that um, if you put your scroll, let's see about the height. If you put your scroll, we flip the we gotta flip the top of that. Oh yes, I'm sorry. Can you put your instrument down? Forgive me. Mm -hmm. We're gonna turn the scroll. I mean, the stand into a table with a. Can you make it flat? Mm -hmm. Horizontal. Yeah. It's gonna make an awful noise. Actually, no, it's not. Gonna make a noise. Oh, no, no. Right. That, that's good. That's good. Should I lower it or is? Well, this... we don't know. Well, yet. we don't know yet. Let's okay. just <laughs> hold your violin up at totally horizontal, like ninety degrees, and let's see. We want that to be an obstruction so you can't go down. Right. We're trying to block oh, it. Okay. So, so you don't know. So it's too high. Yeah. Oh, we don't. We can't. No, our, I can see. Okay. Our angle is very funny. Well, that is. If you could just, leave it, I mean, lower it like an inch or something. Just so you can't go below the horizontal. So you can't go below the top of it. Okay. You know, so that your scroll would knock into it if it went lower. There we go. Okay. Now it's going to feel terrible and it's going to sound terrible. But can you just play? If, <laughs> we don't care what you sound like, you know, this is a different kind of a class. So can you go towards, yeah, to the stand so that it's blocking you like a little closer? even a little closer. Is, is it blocking? Way? Oh, no, you're past it. Sorry. It's hard to tell. There you go. That's good. <laughs> so you get the, the feedback of the thing. Now, it's a little high, but um, it's okay. Can you just try a few notes like that, the beginning of the scherzo? And we're not listening to your playing. That is so awesome. Do you hear that? Yeah, it's a lot brighter here. Yes, it's not just more open like you described. It's much crisper. You have much more articulation. And it's because your bow is not sort of ice skating around the sounding point, you know, trying to find it. <laughs> you know, you basically have a 90 degree relationship mm -hmm. with your bow to the instrument. That's awesome. I know it feels terrible, right? <laughs> kind of. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, can you just play a little longer like that? I just, I'm sort of I'm curious about your, the fatigue level or okay. whether it changes then. So make sure, yeah, you knock into it by accident. Yeah, perfect.
fantastic. Yeah. yeah Does it feel easier? I mean, harder in one sense, of course, but surprisingly, I would think my left arm would feel tired, but it doesn't feel very tired at all. If anything, I almost feel like maybe because I'm having to compensate with my right arm too, like it feels I, it, that might just be something I need to adjust on mine because I feel like I might be trying to compensate with my shoulder rather than my elbow. So like it feels like I feel like. I'm like shrugging a little bit here, so I think I just need to move more with my elbow rather than my shoulder. Right. Right, right. Well, I was going to add one thing, which is that, um, yeah, I mean, I well, did you notice where you hit the scroll, I mean, where you hit the stand, by the way? Um, well, I guess kind of throughout the whole thing. No, no. <laughs> yeah. um, I think um, during the... <laughs> or I guess the parts where I feel like I wanted to like sink in more to the sound that's where I would kind of bring everything down with me which is when the scroll would hit the, the yes top of the stand. right yeah. exactly I also know because it's good to find patterns in where you hit where you bump into the stand mm -hmm. so I also noticed something else I noticed when you go on the g-string and I I could be imagining this but when things are a little harder for you. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> so those are the places to focus on in your practice about keeping it level because it will be become easier. You're just not used to it. That's the first thing. I would always identify where, where the weak spots are. But what I was gonna say before you did this, before we even made this modification, is that if you have trouble on double stops in your in your left hand, uh, the one advantage of being upright, of course, is that you have now much more space here. Mm -hmm. But what I was going to suggest, even if you didn't have space there, is that you anticipate with your left elbow and come around so that your hand is still keeps the curve above the instrument. Mm -hmm. I feel like um, you're sort of reaching for double stops, especially like what it involves like the fourth finger, mm -hmm. right? And so it's no wonder that you're tired. So you said, uh, move the right elbow. Luckily in your case, your, your limbs sort of mirror each other. And I would say definitely um, move, bring your elbow more around for the double stops that give you problems. So that the hand is always looking like the hand and it's not, you know, flattening out or stretching or reaching for the, for the double stubs. So obviously this posture is going to enable that to happen more because you now have all this space. If, you're, if your left arm is clamped against your body, which I know very well, that used to be me, you, you can't really move, <laughs> right? So that's one thing I just wanted to add. And, and as far as the shoulder hiking, I think, um, you're not used to it, obviously, but uh, yes, your observation about the elbow, if you just relax your elbow, your right elbow and let gravity do its job instead of fighting gravity, you know, like a marionette, gravity can really take care of a sound. Uh, gravity, in my opinion, makes a sound. So do you wanna try any of that again so that you're focusing on relaxing your right arm and, and keeping your uh, left elbow able to bring around you can even go on from where you left off or i don't know yeah, did, did you have anything to uh, add to that no you can do that first okay. okay oh but you better go a little closer to the stand because this is too easy no i mean closer that way yeah whatever's going to make you knock into it yeah there you go <laughs>
Just go a little further with the left elbow <laughs> there. Very good, very good. Did you did it feel any different in your shoulder? A little bit. I think it felt better on the A and E string, I think on the lower strings though. Um I guess. Right. Like, that was still a little bit there was still a little bit of this happening on the lower strings, I think. Well, what would happen if you actually didn't bring your elbow up so high? Because Howard always says your elbow should not be, you know, above your shoulder or, you know. Well, the, the, the idea is to move. You want to move in your uh, shoulder joint without the sh whole shoulder blade going up. But um, I'd be curious to know how easy it is for you to do an uh, arm elevation movement. Uh, that's something else. Yeah, we'll do, can we do that in one second? And I also want to say, tell her how to practice for this way. Oh yeah. I was just going to add one thing to the shoulder situation besides doing what he just said, which is that if you want to use less elbow then just use more of your hand. Okay. With you know what I mean? To get over to the D and the G for instance. Like this exactly, one? exactly. Maybe just pick a couple of measures where you have to do that just to just to try that. Yes. Yeah, and if you really use your wrist to flip the bow to the furthest string, then gravity takes care of it. It's it's geometry and gravity, you know, it's like the angle is bigger, exactly. Yes. Yes, yes, do you hear that? Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. The sound is so focused now. And it, even though if it feels awkward, it should feel easier because you're using actually fewer body parts. <laughs> you're just using angles and natural weight instead of this. That's fantastic. Before Howard makes you do an exercise <laughs> or how to practice, can, the one other place I would say in the recitative is the unison, which seems difficult, which it is difficult, but that's a case where the, the music is slow enough that you can anticipate where that unison is, maybe a beat early by opening the space, although now it's open now, so you don't have to think about that anymore, but just, bring your elbow around a beat earlier for the unison. So, because you'll get tight if you sort of lunge for it the way you are. So just try that once and then I know you're covered for the whole piece really. <laughs> It's also in tune now because you see it, it's not a coincidence because if you give yourself the time, if you anticipate, but before it was always flat, of course, because you're kind of, you're not in a position, you're just sort of reaching for it. But now your whole arm has come around to meet the note. That's wonderful. Yeah. So if you're, going to do this at home to, to practice, I would just pick a very short uh, amount of time. Um, so it, it's not, uh, it doesn't drive me crazy. Um, so you put the, you know, you do it in a mirror so that you know that your instrument is really horizontal, not too high, not too low. Uh, and then um, you play like that for five minutes at the most. And then take away 
the music stand, and then play in the mirror. Um, the first time you're not worrying about the mirror, you're just looking at using it to set up the uh, music stand. But the second time when, without, without the music stand, you're gonna look at yourself and just and make sure you're keeping the instrument horizontal. That's really the only thing you're focused on. I've done this with people where they end up not looking at themselves, you know, but that's the whole point <laughs> is to look at yourself to see if, if the instrument is, is horizontal. Um, and but we, in five, five minutes like that, that would be 10 minutes a day. Five minutes each. Five minutes each. Yeah, with the music session. stand and without the music stand. Uh, and then little by little, you try to see if you could get let that seep into your playing where, oh, yeah, I can go up there. I can do that. I can do that. So as far as little by little, would you then suggest like after a week going to 10 minutes at a time or add a minute every day kind of thing? Or what yeah. would you recommend? I would say do, keep it like that for one week. And if you're not driven crazy by it and you see you see the uh, that it's a good outcome, yeah, you could try to do that more. The idea is normal playing um, will hopefully become that way more often. But yeah, you can go up to 10 minutes. Uh, but you always say to do things incrementally so that it doesn't seem like a big effort. So maybe in the second week, you could each day add a minute okay. of this, you know, and then by week three, you, you know, like you just, just keep adding incrementally so it doesn't seem like a big deal to, to do it. Do you typically use a mirror? Oh, uh, yeah. Okay, so great. So the mirror will be really helpful for, you know, look, checking this out and making sure the instrument is not dropping too much. The other great reason to use a mirror um, is that most people face left when they play, including you, which just puts more stress on the left hand to you know, perform <laughs> well or to play well. Using a mirror forces you to have your head, I mean, if you're, looking at your, if you're looking at yourself, your head has to be straight. That's another way of feeling freer, even if it feels awkward. But that's a whole other story. No, I know, but I, I'm saying don't worry about it if, if your head isn't totally straight or whatever. It's just a way to feel as free as possible for five minutes at a time. And you have to line your feet up so you can see yourself. Yeah. Right. Uh, the other thing, the last thing was I want to see how she lives. I know. Around. I was just going to add one more thing, which is that I hope that you can hear the difference between the, the before and the after. And if you're ever not sure, just record yourself, mm -hmm. just to confirm that, because you may feel uncomfortable, you will feel uncomfortable making this modification, although you did it so quickly that I think you're gonna have no problem because there was so much instant gratification. You heard how much better it sounded and it was easier. Mm -hmm. So you will definitely overcome the awkwardness. But if you ever get annoyed by this or us, just record your now old way and the new uncomfortable way, and you'll hear instantly how different it is. And that could be a motivator also to get through the awkwardness. I think we're supposed to see. Okay, so how about, yeah, let's, do no, do let's this? do the exercise, yeah. Uh, do, you, do you do any movement of your arms over your head at all? Uh, just, for, just like this? For exercise, yeah, do you any, do any exercises up there? Um, I mean, I occasionally if I really work out I guess there's some, like... <laughs> just, just, just show me how you raise... Just try putting your instrument down, though. You can put your instrument yeah. down, yeah. Just show me how you would raise one arm straight up to the ceiling, yeah. Like this. Okay, and then do the other one. Okay, and then do you do, you do any exercises where you raise your arms straight up in space? Um, yeah, yeah. What is it? What, what, show me what you do. Um, well, I usually sometimes I'll have like small weights or I guess in my hand. Okay. I'd be curious if you, uh, allow your shoulder blades to go up so they don't, so you feel like your whole shoulder girdle goes up a little bit. From underneath. The, yeah. The so, you, so allow your shoulder blades to reach, to pull your shoulder blades up a little higher. Yeah. yeah. Good. Yeah. And then down. Do you feel that underneath your armpit area? Yeah. Okay. And then come on down. Is that okay? Okay, so I like this movement where you allow your shoulder blades to go up slightly with the arms to get a little bit of a stretch underneath there because some um, people uh, tend to get stuck down. And if you get trained, the muscles get trained up here, you may feel it's easier to keep your arm up, raised up, and you 
you don't lose strength or don't get tired as easily. So I, I might have people do that uh, on breaks for a few reps or try to do at least 10 reps a day uh, during the day at some point, five here, five there, and then on breaks. Or when you're standing online at the airport or in the grocery store. I mean, I do this all day long. Well, you, you cross <laughs> all day over long. Too. And then you can also just re um, uh, rest your hands over your head like that. But um, that's much less labor intensive than getting weights and doing the whole thing. The, the thing to be clear about though, is to not raise your shoulder from the what is this called? The upper traps. Right. You, you, yeah. You, you want to feel like you're, you're feeling, feel like you're working or stretching underneath. If you start to feel it on top, then I have people slide their hands up the wall and try to turn off the muscle on top. But um, it'd be nice if you could feel comfortable with doing these movements. It, it could uh, condition the muscle, the trapezius muscle in your upper back. Especially because you're long limbed. And so now we know that being upright and holding it up is going to be better for you. So definitely do these but as long as you're raising from underneath and palms facing each other yeah okay because that should feel like a stretch it, it felt like a stretch for you right mm -hmm. so what does that mean you always say if it feels like a stretch that means you should be doing it a lot uh no just that's just where you're supposed to feel it that's okay. good you, ha you haven't you haven't let your arm go up in that position that's that's why you feel something there okay. um, so yeah on every break from playing for sure just because that counters this motion. So that's great. You have any questions or anything else? Because we're supposed to stay sort of on time, I guess. Um, I I think a lot of my questions related to, I, yeah, I guess I kind of had all of them answered. <laughs> it was really great. 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 That was one of the fastest improvements I've ever seen or heard. So I, I have great confidence and you should feel good about that. Cause I mean, it should be encouraging to you that it seemed quite easy for you to do that. So yeah, yeah. yeah. That amazing. Was, that was um, very, very well done. Um, You're our new poster child now. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a good uh, prognosis to that you could do that well. Yeah. And the sound was instantly a hundred thousand times more everything, more resonant, as you said, crisper, clearer, bigger, resonant, and easier. So, so much easier. great. Thank you for Thank participating. Thank you so much. Yeah.